Hello, this is Ryan Runcy of Runcy Studios, an artist safe space and art haven. Welcome back, you guys. This is the start of a four part series that I want to do for artists transitioning into business or have already been doing business for a while. And maybe you want to expand your clientele, but there might be some major differences in the clientele you're trying to reach from the clientele you are skilled at acquiring. So I'm going to talk a little bit about each one. Um, today is going to be focused on private clients. In other words, private commissions, um, things that will be hanging in someone's house. So residential commissions, maybe even small private murals in their backyard or in their home. Um, these are most artists bread and butter. Uh, in the other episodes, we'll be talking about commercial clientele and government entities, things like that. But for right now, I want to focus on um, the clientele that you'll have when you make a sale at an art show, when you make a sale at an art festival, online, um, in a pop-up show, anything that's really person-to-person, not for a company. Um, just very hand to hand. So first I'm going to go over some names of these clients. Uh, we call them patrons. We call them, uh, commissioners. We call them just clients or people that bought my art. <laughs> um, you know, it's, it's a very casual connection. Most of the time, these can be your friends family, um, and again, just strangers that happen to see your work at a show and want to support you and want that work in their home or in their office space, but again, on a personal level, not um, being purchased or acquired by the company. So normally these transactions, you know, these are done by you through your system, so uh, there's not really many hoops to go through. These people will ask you the best way to pay you, or you will tell them if you're on top of your negotiation, you'll tell them, I accept any of the known reputable money handlers, PayPal, Venmo, Zelopay, Cash App, etc. I accept cash, check, what have you. That's always up to you. And the best part about these deals is you can negotiate the pay schedule if you want them to pay all up front, if you want them to pay half now, half next month, whatever it is that you determine with them. And trust me, there are way more than just those two that I I mentioned there. Um, but that's a whole nother episode in terms of negotiations. Um, so another thing that we're going to talk about that's very important and is extremely different in terms of clientele is the time span of both the negotiation and the completion of the artwork. When it comes to private sales and personal commissions, everything is up to you and the buyer. So the buyer, if they can afford to pay you all at the, at the time they're purchasing the painting, usually they're happy to. Um, just like going to any store, they're just buying something that they want. They're used to paying for it, so don't make it an awkward transaction. Um, allow them to pay you easily. Don't make it like this is the first time you've ever taken a transaction. In other words, don't be at an art show for the third day of the art show and you finally make a sale, yet you don't know the password to your own account because it's been so long since you've actually logged in. To make a transaction there's these little things that i've done myself and i've seen others do that really mess up the time span and the overall negotiation and closing of a deal uh, the quicker you can accept payments and your accounts can accept the amounts that you're putting through and you're not running into any walls uh, you know it's just smoother for everybody Okay, now on to the next section. What I'm going to call expectations or boundaries. 
what I'm going to say are expectations are what the client has as expectations of you to complete for them. Boundaries are the expectations you have of your client to stay within and not overstep. It's very easy within the creative field for that to happen. So the earlier that you set up those boundaries and make your client aware of how this transaction is going to work, of course, you're going to make sure that a lot of what you're going to do is beneficial for them and you want to lay that out for them, but you want to give them a time scale of when to expect these things. A lot of artists send almost daily updates of progress photos on a painting. And I know for me, that just doesn't work because my work changes so much moment to moment, layer to layer, that I've had clients say, why did, why does this look completely different? This isn't the same painting. And I, I had to try and explain to them that what they saw was an underpainting. Now they're seeing the layers building up to a final painting. So it's, you know, that ugly mid stage that no one actually loves. Uh, as an artist, we sometimes just want to stop working on an artwork. It looks so grotesque and impossible to bring to a completion sometimes, right? So uh, showing your client that that's an experience that they don't get. They're used to seeing finished artworks. So it's very hard for them to understand your process and see it all the way through. So for me, I've set up boundaries to wear. I'll show you the finished artwork, and if you want changes to it from there, then I will adjust, but the process of painting for me is already so anxiety-filled and, I mean, creative and lovely, but stressful to the point that I never know what's going to happen, that I can't try and express something I'm not really sure of, and then lie to keep up with that past hope. I guess, as an artist. So I try to be very vague and express the overall intent of an artwork. And then at the end, I'll see if I hit the mark with them. And usually that's gone really well for me. So that's one of my expectations I have for clients. Um, obviously, pay schedules are big expectations. Contracts are huge expectations. Um, obviously, when we're talking with about government work and commercial work, I'll go way deeper into client um, contracts. But for this, I'm going to go really light on it because I don't always do contracts with my clients. Um, it matters more of the dollar scale. You know, once we start breaking into four figures, then I start putting contracts in place. And it's, again, it's not just to protect me it's always mutual that's the one thing that people especially artists need to realize is contracts are mutual you're protecting them and yourself you make mistakes too that they need to be protected from but they might um they might not go through with a deal in the way that they're supposed to and a contract is a reminder at very least that they have agreed to see this through. And most people, you know, they really do want your work. That's why they took the time to reach out with you and go through all the back and forth all the way up to even the contract. So, you know, don't don't think that they are going to be afraid of your contract. And if you don't know how to write a good contract, unfortunately it can come across very negative or too full of jargon that neither you or your client knows what you're trying to say and they don't know if they're coming out on top or you're trying to pull one over on them. So um, if you need help, you can find different organizations like here in Texas. Uh, very fortunate to have Tala, Texas Accountants and Lawyers Association. I've worked with them for I think seven years now and I mean, they have been phenomenal. They've saved me so many times. They've helped me make money. They've helped me protect my brand. They've helped me protect my artist license. They've helped me. Uh, I mean, they've taught me so much. They taught me to believe in myself and my name. And the fact that um, my kids and my kids' kids
can potentially eat off of me protecting the rights to my work. So those are expectations that, again, will come more into play for clients down the road. But do know you will always maintain um, intellectual property just for your designs and your artworks. Even when someone buys the painting, the idea and the concept is still yours. That's why people don't get to replicate it and sell it as theirs. Again, I want to reiterate that even if your client buys the painting, they do not have the right to take that image, put it on a shirt, and sell that shirt to make profit. They cannot take that image, put it on a billboard, and make money off of it without your consent. This is where you have licensing agreements. Um, people do this with big brands all the time. Uh, you know, you've seen large artists like Shepard Ferry do large deals, but they're getting paid a royalty or a large lump sum for their intellectual property to be used, usually for a set period of time, not indefinitely. That's very rare. So just know you should always be compensated and you maintain these boundaries that keep you in a professional state with your client and the client knows the expectations of you and will pass that along to your other future clients, which is exactly what you want. You don't want them to come in negotiating you down or treating you like you don't know what you're doing because I guarantee your clients talk um, the bigger you get. All right, so with this one, the last topic we're going to go over is negotiation differences. Okay, so again, this is client to client. It's a little bit different here. Um, sometimes it's your friend that you're negotiating with, and if they've really been there for you, maybe they already own 10 of your paintings, so they get that lifetime patron discount where... They don't necessarily name their price, but you have good faith that they're going to take great care of your work. They're not going to give it away to people. So, you know, it's holding value with them, almost like a safe, but it's their investment in you. And so as you grow, that grows in value for them. And if you think they're going to keep coming back for more work and keep supporting your career, those are the people you want to make the discounts for. Now, people that are new, people that haven't ever supported you, you know, you want to get to know them. Usually you want to um, be very frank with them. Again, you are running a business if you're talking about negotiation tactics in the first place. So you don't want to discredit your work. You don't want to tell them your painting is $10,000, but you can have it for one. I mean, to belittle yourself does nothing for you. If you want $1,000, ask for $1,000. Don't tell them that this is a tenth of the value of most everything else I make. So just be aware of how you're presenting yourself, how you are um, positioning yourself in the agreement. Are you putting yourself up on a pedestal? Are you putting yourself up into outer space to where no one understands your evaluation or why you would even ask that price? Are there other artists in the area that you know of that are doing what you're doing better for cheaper? And unfortunately, it can come down to that because you are in a market and this is an artist market space. If somebody just likes that someone's pricing is lower and they find that to be a level of humility and nothing to do with even the skill of the artwork. You might lose that one sale, but at the same time realize it's probably never a sale that you were going to have. So don't bend over backwards for sales that actually put you in the red and hurt your career. It's okay if people don't buy something. All right, you guys, I'm starting to ramble just a bit, so I'm going to wrap this one up. Next time we will be talking about um, clientele, but for the commercial market, big business. 
If you enjoyed this episode, feel free to like and subscribe down below. Until next time, you guys.